Hello, I'm Dr. Carrie Jones, Medical Director for Precision Analytical, Creators of the Dutch Test. Is it low progesterone? Is it a problem with ovulation? Is it a problem with the corpus luteum? Those are the questions we're gonna to answer today, especially when it comes to testing. How do you know if it's low progesterone? How do you know if it's the corpus luteum? How do you know if it's an ovulation issue? Let's go ahead and dive in. So female physiology recap. Those of you who maybe it's been a minute since you've talked about the menstrual cycle, or you don't fully understand the nuances as it comes to the menstrual cycle, let's talk about the follicular and the luteal phase. So when we start at the follicular phase, at the end of her period, what happens is your hormones are declining, right? So you have estrogen coming down, and hib and A is coming down, and that's telling the brain, let's do it again. Let's have another cycle. So the brain then releases FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone, from the pituitary. FSH does exactly what it says it's going to do. It's going to stimulate those follicles to grow in the ovary. Those growing follicles then make estrogen, and they make them when the theca cells have androgens, and the androgens come over to the granulosa cells and make estrogens. So now your estrogen's really starting to rise. When estrogen gets to a point, it tells the brain to choose a main egg that's going to be released. So that's the main egg that's gonna get released at ovulation. Then around mid-cycle, estrogen surges, causes LH to surge, and the LH surge causes the egg to release. So it's bam, 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 it's very quick. Estrogen goes up, then LH goes up, and then the egg comes out and we have ovulation. Once you ovulate, those leftover theca cells and leftover granulosa cells involute on themselves and they become the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum makes progesterone. A healthy luteal phase is about 12 to 16 days. Once you're at about 11 days or shorter, it's called luteal phase defect. But if she becomes pregnant, then of course the corpus luteum will continue to make progesterone until that placenta is strong enough to take over, generally around weeks 10, 11, or 12 of pregnancy. Otherwise, if she's not pregnant, then as she is in days like 26, 27, our hormones start to fall because she's not pregnant, triggering her period on average around day 28-ish. So low luteal progesterone, let's answer some questions. First and foremost, did she ovulate? On the left-hand side, if she didn't, nope, no egg is released, then progesterone will be really quite low because it's not able to be produced. The only way to make progesterone, of course, is to have the corpus luteum pump out the progesterone at the direction of the signaling from the brain. On the right-hand side, if you said, yes, she did ovulate and egg was released, then the next question is, is her progesterone at a healthy level? No, if it's not at a healthy level, if it's maybe on the lower end of the luteal range, then we know she either has a poorly functioning corpus luteum, poorly functioning brain signaling, or a combination of both. But if yes, she does have healthy progesterone levels, then she does have a healthy corpus luteum. So this is the sort of uh, flow chart you're gonna go through and ask yourself, did she ovulate, start there, and then yes or no, and work your way down to help narrow in on what could be going on. But the question is, can a one day hormone test give you all the answers that you need? If you check her progesterone on day 19 and it's healthy, does that mean she's healthy on day 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, onwards? You don't know, it's just a one day test. So maybe, maybe a one day test, but depending on her case, you might actually need more data. This is where DUTCH comes in. So DUTCH is an acronym, Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. And we're gonna talk about specifically what's called the cycle mapping or cycle mapping plus. But first, when we look at DUTCH, DUTCH has a very easy collection. It's a dried urine test so a lot of women who are afraid of getting their blood draw or they don't like to spit in a tube, it's a really nice test because you can just urinate on the pieces of paper, especially when we talk about the test, the cycle mapping test, and she's doing it every single day. Most women don't want their blood drawn every day and they don't want to spit in a tube every day, but urinating on a piece of filter paper in the morning, pretty straightforward and pretty easy. 
It's the most comprehensive hormone profile. It takes into account not only all of the hormone markers you're familiar with, estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, S, but it also looks at their metabolites. So think about estrogen and then where does estrogen go? It's called estrogen metabolism. A lot of people, of course, refer to it as phase one and phase two, estrogen detoxification. We are androgens. You make testosterone, you make DHEAS. Maybe they're going down that potent alpha pathway and that's what's causing some of their symptoms such as hair loss or acne. The Dutch test also looks at melatonin, cortisol, cortisol rhythm throughout the day, cortisone, which is inactive, plus a number of organic acids. So you really get a very comprehensive look at what's going on with your patient. For those of you who are using hormone replacement therapy, it is the most versatile HRT monitoring tool. And Dutch has now a handful of published validation data out there as to looking at dried urine and 24-hour urine, dried urine and serum, dried urine and saliva, and validating it, which is really, really important. When you choose a testing option, you want to make sure that it has the research to back it up. And lastly, of course, there's an entire clinical team waiting to help. We understand that when you're dealing with hormones, sometimes it can feel like herding cats. And so by having a clinical team to help you understand what the report means, what the, all the dials mean, go through the case history with your client, can be really nice and give you some um, ideas and consultation moving forward of where you should look, what you should go, and what you should consider. So let's look at the cycle mapping. Since we're talking about ovulation, we're talking about progesterone, we're talking about the corpus luteum, the cycle mapping is where we look at the cycle all month long. So it's the best test for women who are or who should be cycling. The great thing about the cycle mapping is that you can combine it with our Dutch Complete, which is our flagship test, or our Dutch Plus. And the Dutch Plus is what we're going to talk about in um, some of our cases when it comes to the cortisol awakening response. So the cycle mapping, oops, the cycle mapping is something you want to consider for women who struggle with infertility. Women whose hormonal symptoms tend to fluctuate throughout the cycle. PMS, mid-cycle spotting, migraines, what have you. Women who say, I get migraines on day 13 and 14, and then again on day 26 and 27. It's, it's a lot to have her test on all of those days uh, to go get a blood draw or to quick do a saliva test. But by doing the cycle mapping test, we can then stand back and see what's happening throughout her whole cycle. Women who were with cycling hormones, but no menstrual cycle, meaning she doesn't bleed. Maybe she's had an ablation. Maybe she has um, the progestin IUD. So women with irregular cycles and who still have hormonal symptoms, women with PCOS, if the luteal phase shifts from month to month and you're just trying to get a bird's eye view of what's going on, and if you're not sure when to test her due to long or short cycles. These are all considerations on which, which woman you might choose for the cycle mapping. Now, what I prefer are those who are struggling with fertility issues and those who have hormonal symptoms sort of throughout her cycle that it's hard to pinpoint a specific one day to test her because, we, again, we want to get that bird's eye view and see what's going on. So this is what the Dutch cycle mapping looks like. We divide it up into estrogens on the top and progesterones on the bottom. And if we focus in, when we look at the estrogens, at the progesterones, what you will see looks like this. We have the black dotted line, which is the upper and lower reference range. So she ideally would be in the black dotted line. We look at estradiol and estrone in the top, and we look at the beta and the alpha pregnane dials at the bottom. So estrogen at the top, progesterone at the bottom. When we look at the follicular phase, we know that estrogen has to surge there, and we look to see if estradiol and estrone are fitting in that reference range, or if she's getting that estrogen surge, and in this example, she is. We know in the follicular phase, progesterone should be really, really low. She hasn't ovulated yet. Then she ovulates. In this case, she ovulated on day 14. How do we know she ovulated on day 14? Because on day 15 moving forward, her progesterone went up. Remember, she's the blue and the red line, ideally within the black dotted line. So by looking at the cycle mapping, we have a really good idea if she ovulated 
by looking at progesterone. We can also look at the estrogen in the luteal phase. We hear all the time the term estrogen dominance. And when we mean estrogen dominance, what we mean is this specific section right here. We mean what is estrogen doing in the luteal phase relative to progesterone? Because if she didn't ovulate, then she's not going to have healthy levels of progesterone and her estrogen will dominate in this area. On the flip side, in this example, her progesterone is nice, you know, much higher than her estrogen and this person is not estrogen dominant. So why is the cycle mapping my absolute favorite test? Let me give you a little insight into this case. So this is a 25 year old with 34 day cycles, really heavy periods, menorrhagia, moderate to severe PMS. And of course she got blood work done and all was normal. We hear this all the time, don't we? So she got her blood drawn on day 23 because her practitioner was thinking, well, it's a 34 day cycle. You probably ovulate and then mid luteal would be day 23. And if you look where the orange arrow is and the purple dotted, like sort of trying to show you, that's where day 23 is. And on this cycle mapping, because she did a cycle mapping at the same time, you can see it's right in the normal range. It's exactly what the blood work said. She, the blood work is right. On day 23, her estrogen is normal. And that's exactly what it says here. Same for day 23 progesterone. Her day 23 progesterone is right where it should be. It is normal. So if you just went off of this one day, day 23 test, it would say she's not estrogen dominant relative to her progesterone and her progesterone is healthy. But here's the kicker. I did a cycle mapping this whole cycle on her and you can see from day 24 until she gets her period, she gets the second bump in estrogen relative to her progesterone. So her progesterone is declining whereas her estrogen is now going up for a second bump for whatever reason. This is why she's having so many symptoms day 24 leading up to her cycle on day 34. She's having 10 full days of excessive estrogen relative to her progesterone. Now the one day test just missed it. It doesn't mean the one day test was wrong. The wrong day test was in fact right. On that one day, her estrogen was normal. On that one day, her progesterone was normal. But again, bird's eye view, we need the macroscopic, we need to step back, see the whole cycle and realize that she has some estrogen that's a little bit crazy, right? She's got, she has two bumps of estrogen in the follicular phase and then a second bump in the luteal phase. So by looking at this, we could easily swoop in and help to address her heavy periods and her PMS and the other symptoms that she's having. This is why it's my favorite test. Having said that though, not everyone should do a cycle mapping. So who should not do a cycle mapping as a first line test? Please don't do it on menopausal women. Please don't do it on women who are on hormonal birth control, such as the pill, the patch, the ring, the injection. You wanna rem uh, remember the mechanism of action of these. They shut down the um, HPO axis, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, so that the pill can take over. If you run a cycle mapping on a woman on a birth control pill, it will have a low flat line for estrogen and progesterone. Please don't use it for women on oral or sublingual, which is the dissolvable under the tongue progesterone, including pregnenolone. What happens is due to first pass, so when they swallow the progesterone, it goes right to the liver. First pass effect, it, it explodes into a lot of metabolites. All of that comes out on the urine and it looks falsely elevated. Women on oral estrogen, same thing. They swallow the estrogen, it explodes into a lot of metabolites and it shows up in the urine. Women with a diagnosis of premature ovarian failure or insufficiency, depending on how you call it, and are not cycling. Again, much like menopausal women, it will show a low flat line. It doesn't mean you can't work with these women. You should absolutely work with these women. This test should not be your first line um, test to run when working with them. Same for women with long-standing amenorrhea. Again, the results are a low flat line. Still work with these women, work to get her amenorrhea resolved, and then consider a cycle mapping. You already know with long-standing amenorrhea what her hormones or estrogen and progesterone will likely look like. So save her money, focus on other testing um, under these circumstances. 
This is an example of a woman who did the cycle mapping anyhow while on 100 to 150 milligrams of oral progesterone daily. And you can see she's the blue and the red line that are way, way, way above the black dotted line. This does not tell you very much. She was hoping that by uh, using the cycle mapping, she could see if her, if her progesterone was affecting her ovulation. Um, and unfortunately, because of the high number of metabolites that oral progesterone causes, and she's on replacement, we don't know if she's ovulating, not, not on the cycle mapping anyhow. Um, that's not the way to go about it. So please, if you're doing oral progesterone or pregenolone, this is not the test to consider. So let's look at a case. Look at, look at a cycle mapping plus case when it comes to ovulation. So 39-year-old reports insomnia, mild PMS, the occasional menstrual migraine. Her periods are regular, 24 to 26 days. She bleeds light to moderately for five days, doesn't have a lot of clots. Minimal cramps, she does get breast tenderness in the luteal phase. Menstrual migraines are three to four cycles a year. Her stress has been much, much higher and she's not sleeping that well. She tends to wake in the middle of the night. So this isn't a, um, like a forever thing. This has been a recent thing where she's been noticing these symptoms. So if we look at her particular cycle mapping, you can see that there she's, on the day of collection, it was a 24-day cycle. You can see her estrogen does rise, but because she's a shorter cycle, um, it's shifted to the left. So while she's not in the black dotted line, she is lined up for where she should be for a, a four-day cycle. Because if she was 28 days, we would just shift everything to the right four days, and then she would line up. Estrogen is not the problem in the follicular phase. Then in the luteal phase, you can see that her estrogen bumps up a bit over and then she comes back down to day 24. So she's slightly higher above the black dotted line uh, there in the, um, in the luteal phase. When we look at her progesterone, we know that she does ovulate um, around day 12-ish, 12 12-13, 12, because she does get a rise in progesterone uh, relative to the follicular phase. So she's a person who ovulates, but she doesn't do it well. So either the signaling from the brain is not that great, or her corpus luteum is not that great. Because this is the Dutch test, I did wanna throw in a few extra markers to show you what else is going on with her. This is the estrogen detoxification portion of our test, which if you are new to this portion of our test, it could be a little um, overwhelming. If you are familiar with the Dutch test, then you see this all the time. At the top, across the top, we have our three estrogens, E1, E2, and E3. And then below that, we have three arrows, a green arrow, a red arrow, and a blue arrow. And those lead to our phase one estrogen metabolism markers. In the lower left-hand corner, you will see other dials, says 2-methoxy. The 2-methoxy at 5.17, that is her phase two metabolism. So when we're looking at this, just as a, as a, as a quick snapshot, and her phase one, she does favor the 2-hydroxy, the two, this is the um, less carcinogenic metabolite of, of those who go through phase one estrogen detox. But what happens is to move through into phase two, where her 2-methoxy is, it's sluggish. Her phase two is working, it's just not working fast enough. And what we do is we give you a gauge known as the methylation gauge, and her methylation gauge is low. So she methylates, just not that quickly. This can affect estrogen symptoms. Then, if we are to summarize just the hormone portion before I move into the cortisol portion, so she has a healthy preovulatory estrogen rise. She does ovulate on day 13-ish, but her progesterone rise is weak. She has slightly elevated estradiol levels in the luteal phase, and her phase two estrogen is sluggish. So not great progesterone, and then as a result, the estrogen, so to speak, is winning. Now we look at her cortisol awakening response and her cortisol in general. Remember, she said she struggles to sleep and stress has been a lot higher. The cortisol awakening response, which is that first response that should happen, she, when you wake up in the morning, it goes up in 30 minutes, and then gradually starts to come down the rest of the day. So the collection is done rather quickly, and you can see my other webinar all about the cortisol awakening response and autoimmunity in this program. So for her, she's the blue line, and she should be in between the black lines. Her blue line starts out the day high, and then she goes a lot higher. She starts out the day stressed. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's no wonder she can't sleep. And then, when we look at the rest of her saliva, her saliva, her metabolized cortisol, is at the higher end. 
6,500 is the cutoff. She's at 64.15. Coupled with this high cortisol in the morning tells me she has a lot of stress going on. She has a lot of cortisol production. Her HPA excess is really fired up. Remember that cortisol, glucocorticoids, can suppress your GnRH pulses from the brain. Therefore, you could suppress LH or FSH pulses out to the ovary. With all that cortisol, it's definitely possible that over time, it's affecting the way that her body pulses out to the ovary to one, ovulate, and to two, make progesterone. So if you, if it's been a while, GnRH, of course, from the hypothalamus, then goes to the pituitary and you make FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone. So FSH is dominant in the early follicular phase and the GnRH pulses are lower and slower to get FSH to do its job. LH, which is dominate in the late follicular phase and then of course in the luteal phase, um, it, the GnRH pulses are faster and higher to get LH to do its job. So if you have a lot of cortisol, it could be potent enough to suppress both LH and FSH or just slow down the pulses. And as LH is higher and faster, it will likely get slowed down first. And that means you favor FSH and you will favor estrogen. So in her case in particular, that higher cortisol likely suppressed LH. Now she favors FSH and favors estrogen. So she has lower progesterone and low progesterone, of course, can worsen insomnia and worsen PMS. So for her, treatment considerations focus on the cause, reduce stress. Why? Why has she been stressed out more lately? And let's work on that. Of course, initiating stress reduction and mindfulness in the morning, improving sleep hygiene routines at night. What happens is a lot of people, um, you know, especially if they are uh, entrepreneurs, own their own business, their parents, they will put their children down for bed and then they will use that time to catch up. They will catch up on their job. They will catch up on email. They will catch up on TV shows. Um, they will catch up on all the things in the day that they weren't able to do and it winds them up and then they have trouble with sleep. So working on calming things such as holy basil or Tulsi tea, chamomile tea before bed, things like magnesium glycinate before bed. And then in the morning, because her stress response um, is, is reported and seen on testing is not that great, then consider things like adaptogens in the morning, consider things like chase tree to help with that uh, corpus luteum and all the signaling. Consider things like B-complex, which help give the co-nutrients, the cofactors to a lot of these enzymatic processes. And again, mitochondrial support to help uh, um, the cells that make the hormones in the first place, uh, the, the first step is always in the mitochondria. So to make progesterone, to make estrogen, to make testosterone, the very first step is that cholesterol has to go into the mitochondria, convert into pregnenolone, and then go from there. And so by supporting that very first step in the mitochondria, it can definitely help with hormone production. Let's look at another case. This is a 22-year-old with PCOS. So she's never been regular. She ranges from 25 to 50 days. She bleeds for seven straight days when she gets her period. She does have clots, moderate cramps. So she sounds relatively estrogen dominant, doesn't she? Relatively low progesterone. She's mild cystic acne on the jawline and neck. That's always present. And with women with PCOS, we know that's often very androgenic, of course. She feels, quote, more hairy than her friends. She's been struggling to lose weight. She's moderately tired all the time and her stress has been high. Her mother and her maternal grandmother are hypothyroid, but she herself has never been tested. When we look at her cycle mapping, now she'd had a very long cycle. You can see that she um, gets, she had like a 37 day cycle. I wanna say when she did this one, it ends, it, uh, she you can see the ending there in between the 35 and the 40. And then her estrogen, her estrogen is relatively dominant compared to her progesterone. And when we look at her progesterone, she doesn't rise ever. She, she doesn't really ever get out of the, um, or up into, I should say, the black dotted uh, reference ranges. And so for her, she has an anovulatory cycle. She does not ovulate at all. Unlike the last case, that woman ovulated, but brain signaling and corpus luteum support are important to help produce progesterone. This woman isn't ovulating in the first place. 
Again, if we look at her estrogen um, detoxification, estrogen metabolism, especially because of her symptoms, seven days of bleeding, clots, PMS, what have you, um, we can see for her, when we look at her results, the dial that's the highest is 16-OH. 16-OH is in the red. 16-OH is known as the proliferative metabolite. It causes things to grow. So it can increase the lining of the uterus. It can cause heavy periods and cramps. Um, and it could, in a woman with breast cancer, cause her breast cancer to go or to grow. Unfortunately, the healthier dial, or the, I should say, the less carcinogenic option, um, is the 2-hydroxy at the bottom, and it is low. So we would want to almost flip these. We would want her 16 to be a little lower and her 2 to be a little higher. And unfortunately, again, her methylation is not that great. She's uh, leaning more towards the low end, and we know as we work to improve her overall estrogen detoxification, that it could put a burden on this enzyme, this COMT enzyme, and we would want to support it. Now, in her case, I also wanna show you the androgens off the Dutch test because the androgens are things like DHEAS and testosterone, and here you will see for her they're low. This is where it can be really um, confusing if you ran these reports or these labs in blood because if you ran her testosterone you would see her testosterone is low and you would think well that's not possible she has PCOS and she has cystic acne why is her testosterone low all of her testosterone is moving downstream she's moving down this 5 alpha pathway called androsterone and this eventually turns into DHT dihydrotestosterone and 5 alpha dihydrotestosterone is more potent than testosterone. So by doing the Dutch test and peeling back the layer of her androgens, we were able to see that while her testosterone is low, that's not the problem. It's further down the pathway that's the problem. And she's making a lot of these androgenic metabolites, hence the cystic acne, hence the feeling hairier than her friends. So in summary, she has an anovulatory cycle. That's why her progesterone is low. She doesn't release an egg in the first place. She favors the proliferative 16-OH or 16-hydroxy. She has lower levels of the 2-hydroxy, uh, which is um, unfortunate. It's the less carcinogenic one. We'd want that one to be a little higher. Her methylation could be better. And as you work on her estrogen, you definitely want this to be better. And she has increased 5-alpha reductase, that enzyme, again, that can contribute to cystic acne and hairiness. If we peek at her adrenals really quickly, her metabolized cortisol is low. Metabolized cortisol is the total cortisol production and metabolism through the liver. When this drops down, the first thing we start to think is thyroid. And remember I said her mom and her maternal grandmother had thyroid issues, but she had never been tested. So you would definitely wanna test her to see what's going on. And we can, we can um, oftentimes uh, see a thyroid influence on the Dutch test. Her free cortisol is in range at 9.97, but not great because 9.6 is the cutoff. And her cortisol awakening response, while it does go up normally, she needs a little more oomph, right? Like she goes up, but she probably wants the entire mountain to go to, to raise, to get her more in between um, the black lines so that she's has more energy, especially in the morning. So her, her, um, her, her, rhythm, her up-down movement is correct. We just need more oomph to get there. So for her, treatment considerations is we need to look probably at more information beyond just the Dutch test. So of course, with PCOS, if not done already, looking at glucose and insulin, possibly leptin, especially as weight loss has been a problem for her. Given her low metabolized cortisol, her family history of thyroid, absolutely looking at thyroid and thyroid antibodies. Her long irregular cycles, you always want to check prolactin. And of course, we know that the gut microbiome has such a huge impact on hormones, including estrogen detoxification, to consider microbiome testing. Addressing the cause when it, we're looking at treatment considerations as you're working her up. And then I have a number of supportive um, ways to support uh, the HPO, the hypothalamic pituitary ov ovarian axis, and ovulation. Things like chase tree, B6, maybe even looking at uh, ovarian or brain glandulars, 
cycling progesterone, if that's in your scope of practice, brain support in general, such as Bacopa, um, you know, omegas, things like that, mitochondrial support, anything to one, help with signaling, and two, improve um, the act of ovulation will be helpful here. Once she's cycling more regularly, I'm often asked, you know, should I put her on DIM, methane? Does she need DIM? Well, she's not really, her cycles are irregular. And while her estrogen is higher compared to her progesterone, you don't want to drop her estrogen too low until you've really worked out her cycles. So maybe consider DIM later, because as we know, DIM, methane, can lower estrogen out of circulation. So just be cautious if you're going to use DIM right off the bat with her. But you can consider COMT or that phase two support. I had said that enzyme helps you get from the hydroxy to the methoxy, and we like that. We like that phase two. And common support includes magnesium and zinc, methylated B vitamins, choline, methionine, sulforaphane, trimethylglycine, things like that. And 5-alpha reductase support. Now, 5-alpha reductase is interesting and that it does increase with things like inflammation, insulin, which she likely has high insulin, stress, but you can Band-Aid reduce it with some supplements, medications too, of course. Uh, you know, this is why people go on medications such as spironolactone. But from a uh, natural point of view, you're looking at sal palmetto, stinging nettle root, pygium, reishi. Reishi happens to be my favorite for 5-alpha and EGCG from green tea. So in summary, the cycle mapping plus where we have the combination of the cycle mapping and the Dutch plus so we get that cortisol awakening response provides the comprehensiveness of the month-long estrogen progesterone collection in combination with all the benefits of the Dutch Plus when that one-day test isn't enough data. Now, remember that one-day test may, is not necessarily wrong. It's just not the big picture. You need a bird's eye view sometimes for uh, these the females who are having symptoms throughout their cycle or trying to figure out, like, why was my one-day test wrong? Or not, uh, I feel wrong. I feel bad. The one-day test said I was normal and I'd like a better view of what's going on. And it is the test of choice for women struggling with hormonal symptoms throughout their cycle while needing the added benefit of the cortisol awakening response. So as you know, the cortisol awakening response gives you insight into what's happening with your cortisol in the morning and cortisol in general has such a big impact on your menstrual cycle, on signaling from the brain, GNRH, FSH, and LH. And by combining the two tests together, you just get that many more data points, that much more information about your patient or client so that you can really help to improve their health outcomes. If you are brand new to the Dutch test and you'd like to become a provider today, you will receive information about receiving 50% off up to five kits. That does include the cycle mapping plus, yes. So you could get that for 50% off. Plus, you look at or you receive clinical consultations with Dutch experts once you get your results on what the test means and patient referrals in your area of service. So when you sign up, you are entered into our system. And then when we get phone calls and emails and, you know, SOS messages about help, I have all these hormonal issues and this is the zip code or area that I live in. Who could you refer me to? We can give them your information. So to get started, please feel free to call the lab or to email us at sales at dutchtest.com. You can also sign up on our website, dutchtest.com, to become a provider today. And that concludes our talk. Thank you so much for listening.